Hi everybody, I'm Chris Kanish, and this is CS361, Systems Programming. Let's get started. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the motivations and concepts behind building a dynamic memory allocation system. There are a lot of knobs and levers that you can turn when you're designing a dynamic memory allocator, and it really comes down to what are your engineering trade-offs? What cases are you trying to make fast? And it's a fantastic example of the design thinking that we've been trying to build over the course of this class. So let's get started with talking about what our problem is and how we're going to approach it. So dynamic memory allocation, as we know, is necessary because the stack and the globals are defined at compile time. What stack variables you're using, what global data structures you're using are set in stone. You can't dynamically change or grow what's in there based on the workload of your program. So dynamic memory allocation is a way for us to say at runtime, we need a certain amount of memory and we didn't know what would be necessary beforehand. And at a high level, the two things that we have in terms of memory allocation is a very coarse grain system that the operating system gives us and a fine grain system that is the purpose of this entire chapter. So our fine grain system uses this API. This is a very common API whenever we're using an explicit memory allocator where we're going to malloc to ask for new things and we're going to free when we are done using them. This is different from other languages like Java or JavaScript or Python, where the language runtime keeps track of which objects you have access to. But C is different. C allows you to operate on raw pointers. If you can point at a specific area of memory and it's a valid region of memory, then you can access it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Therefore, we need to be explicit about what we malloc and what we free, and it's really easy for us to shoot ourselves in the foot when we are using an explicit allocator, but it does give us full control over what's happening. A little bit of nomenclature right here. When we talk about a block, we're gonna talk about both the payload, kind of the thing that you get back from malloc, as well as any padding and metadata that surrounds that. So if we have a certain block and has a certain size, that's the entirety of this thing, rather than simply the interior, the part that was asked for by the user. So this is the fine grain application that we want to create. And this API is one thing. We can say we malloc to get back a pointer, we free to get it back to the allocator to mark it as unallocated, and it will just churn through all of the memory that it has available to it to give us what we want, which is relatively straightforward. But how it accomplishes it is a little bit more complicated. Before we go into that, we're gonna see what malloc is built on top of when we're talking about sbreak and mmap and malloc and free. S-break is a system call that does incur a certain amount of expense in terms of time when we're switching over to the kernel mode and then switching back from kernel mode. So in general, we don't want to do that every single time we're doing a memory allocation. We don't want to invoke the operating system when a library that locally handles things at the you know few bytes, 100 bytes, 200 bytes level could be much, much more efficient by just giving out a little bit of memory, reclaiming a little bit of memory without even having to switch between user mode and kernel mode. So this coarse grain, fine grain component is not just something that makes our design more complicated. It's pretty necessary, both from a space standpoint, because we only get the granularity of pages. The operating system only thinks in terms of pages, as well as that time standpoint, because it's going to be much, much faster to say, oh, you just gave me back 32 bytes from this free block. You asked for 32 new bytes. I'm just going to give you that same one back. No new memory gets allocated. If that address range is still in the cache, it's still going to be nice and fast. Everybody's happy. Traditionally, malloc was built completely on top of the break functionality, which would increase or decrease the size of the heap. But modern allocators use both sbreak and mmap to get the best performance it possibly can. So sbreak allows us to say at a page level granularity, what should the boundary be between legal heap addresses and illegal heap addresses? If the heap addresses are illegal, the page table doesn't need to have entries for it. It just doesn't exist. It would cause a seg fault if you were to try to access it. All that good stuff, or is everything that's inbounds. If you access it, it won't cause a seg fault in and of itself if you're accessing the wrong thing, or if you try to free something that wasn't allocated yet, or try to access something that has been freed and has been corrupted by the memory allocator. You can very easily cause your program to work incorrectly, but there won't be any fundamental problem with accessing anything that's below that S break boundary. MMAP, as we hinted at a little bit before when we were in the file portion of class, is a way for us to map a file into the memory address at an arbitrary address or a specific address that we choose. This allows us to have our own user level control over what gets put where in memory. 
we can map up an entire file into memory starting at a specific address. But we can also say operating system, give me a whole bunch of memory. I don't care where it is. I just want you to give me something that's mapped in as a bunch of zeros. And then you can start using it. Malik in a lot of implementations will use this approach to give it good performance. So switching back and forth between these two slides, we see that malloc and free are what we want to implement and sbreak and nmap are what we're going to implement it on top of. We're going to ask our operating system, hey, give us chunks of memory, maybe four kilobytes at a time, a megabyte at a time, several megabytes at a time, and then we're going to dole it out to the user level program that is doing this. Malloc is implemented as a library. It uses the system calls underneath sbreak and nmap to get its job done. And there's a huge amount that has to go on here in order to make it work well. And first, we have to define what does well mean. First off, the most important part is that you need your allocator to be correct. If you allocate something, it is given to that user. They have a specific region of memory. And until they say, oh, hey, I'm definitely not using this anymore, it should be valid and it shouldn't be touched by anybody else. Remember my my rule of thumb is that making something faster gets you a raise, but making something correct keeps you employed. Second of all, we don't want this to take too much time. We want it to be efficient in time and get these allocations done as fast as possible, get the freeze done as fast as possible so that we're not interrupting the user level program. Our definition of fast can not only be, you know, what's the minimum time or the average time, but also trying to make sure that there aren't really big pauses. There's a lot of situations where you're using an implicitly dynamically allocated language like Python or Java, and there are these things called garbage collector pauses where those implicit allocators decide, oh, hey, I really need to fix all of my memory because I left it really, really messy. I need to stop your running program from doing its instructions and come over here into this library and fix a whole bunch of stuff. So where one free might usually take a few microseconds, if one all of a sudden takes 20 milliseconds, that's a huge difference. And if you're in a specific situation where you need to have low latency responses, maybe you're building a stock trading platform, that level of jitter, which is the difference in the response times, can possibly be dangerous. So when we talk about something being correct, that's super important. But taking too much time, it's a little bit more subtle. Do we want a... a it's a little bit more subtle. Sometimes we'll talk about the average amount of time, the expected amount of time. Sometimes we'll talk about the jitter between the different response times. And what, a, what you'll see a lot of the time in professional settings is a 95th percentile or 99th percentile or 99.9th percentile slowest possible response. So what that would be is if we said, I want to take every single time I ever called malloc or every single time I ever called free, and I want to stack them from the fastest one to the slowest one. And that's gonna be a whole big long line. Now, if I go 90% through that line, so that the one that's 90th slowest out of 100 is going to be the 90th percentile response rate. And you know, the 99th out of 100th is gonna be the second most bad response time. And that gives us this idea of the tail response time. So in really bad case scenarios that might not happen often, but are still gonna be important, we wanna say, even in the worst case scenario under this workload, we're only gonna take 20 microseconds to do a free or to do a malloc. That's what's embodied when we talk about taking too much time. It gets very tricky, but it's super, super important when we diagnose and profile and optimize real world systems. Beyond that, we also don't wanna to take too much memory, right? We talked a little bit about this in the previous week's lectures. We're talking about internal fragmentation and external fragmentation. So if I have my memory address space and I'm given a nice big chunk by the sbreak functionality. It says, okay, your old start of the heap is here, your new start of the heap is here, and I have all this space to work with. That's pretty awesome. And what could happen is well, I say, okay, well, I'm gonna take this first one, I'm gonna give it to the user level program, then I've got a bunch of free space here, then I'm gonna give this part to a user level program, then I've got a whole bunch of free space here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can see that if you chop this up in weird ways, if the next request is asking for you know, this much space. This one isn't gonna fit because it's too small. This one's not gonna fit because it's too small. But if we could somehow combine these, we would be able to serve this request, but we can't because we fragmented our memory. And once we've given those addresses to the user level program, we can't take them back. Once they have them, they're gonna have them until they decide to give them back. And then we can do a lot of fancy things. But the main idea here is that if we're good about where we place things, 
then we'll be able to use our memory more efficiently before we go back to the operating system and say, hey, I actually need more RAM. I need more pages for my user level process to actually run. So just to reiterate with a few of our funny GIFs on the screen while we're doing it, when we don't wanna to take too much time, what our job is going to be is when we free, we wanna keep those organized in a way that we get efficient pieces back. When we ask for something via Mac, we wanna get it back nice and quick. And we need to trade off this time with the space as we'll see in just a moment, right? Because something could be very, very time efficient. Like we just get things back really, really fast, but we waste a whole bunch of space by just doing the dumbest possible, fastest possible thing. Likewise, when we're trying not to take too much memory, we also want to make sure we minimize that fragmentation because fragmentation is almost certainly going to happen. We don't know what the requests are that are gonna come in. So we can't really predict what they are. We, we can say, okay, in general, when people use memory allocators or when they use them for a specific situation, they usually use them in this way. So I'm gonna optimize my design for that. We're not gonna worry about that in class here, but in real world memory allocators, there's a lot of, oh, the workloads that people almost always do look like this, so let's use this special case. There's things like memory allocation, things like sorting algorithms in real systems are very often not just quick sort or just merge sort or whatever it is that's gonna happen. They're gonna say, in the real world, things aren't just asymptotic time. They're gonna have a lot of special cases. Again, we're not gonna to see too much of that in here, but if you do wanna dig into say how GNU Malloc works, that's a fantastic idea for seeing how these real systems are built. So the next few videos that we're gonna be going over are first gonna see how to make an allocator. Now that we've said, here's what the challenge is, we're gonna have the space time trade-off. We're gonna design a system on top of S-break and M-map, really just S-break for our purposes in class and it's going to look like malloc and free, that's all we have to do. It's relatively straightforward, but there's a lot of different choices that we're gonna make there. So the first thing that we're gonna look at is in the abstract, how are we going to design one of these explicit memory allocators? When we're given the memory by the operating system, how are we gonna arrange it so that we're both space and time efficient? Now that we know we need to use sbreak to grow and shrink our heap, we're gonna use that functionality and our ability to set our own bytes and bits however we want to create the malloc and free functionality that user level code in C uses. There's a lot of moving pieces there and we're gonna see what those moving pieces are and how we can optimize space, how we can optimize time, where we can make those decisions to make things work both correctly, super, super important, but also efficient in time and space. And then we're also gonna look a little bit more closely at how the homework floor allocator works. We'll go over a few demos of just messing around in the code. And finally, from last week's 12.30 p.m. discussion section, I actually did a really extensive explanation of how the garbage collector works. So between that and the Monday lab from this week, you'll probably be able to get a really good idea of what's necessary for that assignment. So I would definitely say, besides these two, if you're studying the homework, definitely go back and watch that. I cut it down to, I think, about 40 minutes of talking about these things. You can skip around, but the important parts are definitely in there of what it is you're trying to accomplish. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.